Um, thank you very much for the organisers of the com this committee t for um, inviting me to speak. Um, what I'm hoping to do in this very um, quite short first section is to build on um, last year's conference, but also recognising that many of you wouldn't have been here last year, give a brief introduction to AMR and some of the concepts, and also um, uh, obviously focusing on human medicine, uh, introduce some of the topics that are going to be discussed in more detail in the workshops later on. So by necessity, I won't be going into huge detail um, because things are, uh, that I bring up are going to be discussed later. Um, perhaps uh, a good place to start, um, and where I usually start lectures such as this, is with Alexander Fleming. This, th th this is text from his Nobel Prize acceptance speech in 1945. Remember, he, he discovered um, penicillium uh, causing penicillin in 1928, 29. Um, so this is some years later, but he, he'd more or less got it. Um, he understood the issues that um, within the laboratory, you could select organisms that were resistant to penicillin very easily. And not only that, he postulated that if antibiotics were used um, unwisely, that resistance would spread and would limit the useful life of these agents. So uh, having said that, and you know, perhaps we all might as well get up and go home now, because th th this has been known for a long time. And it's not clever, it's just simple Darwinian selection, um, survival of the fittest, and it, it sort of brings out the concept that the more you use antibiotics, the more antibiotic resistance you're likely to see. Um, so um, very um, uh, many of us get involved in surveillance of um, antibiotic resistance. And this is just one typical report um, from Seattle, and it's looking at the organism Staphylococcus aureus, and as you can see, the figures are quite big and scary, that 40% of isolates were resistant to four or more antibiotics. And why uh, I show this is just to emphasize, this is um, 1959 in, in Seattle. So antibiotic resistance is not new. Why are we worried about it now particularly? Uh, well, it's because um, antibiotic resistance is uh, increasing at a rapid rate and that rate appears to be uh, accelerating. And not only that, but we have very few new agents coming to market, and I'll elaborate on that in a, in a, in a little bit, uh, to replace the ones that we've got. Um, this perhaps is a, is a corporate slide um, from the Department of Health, but I, I, um, I show it just to um, demonstrate to you what the current uh, UK uh, strategy for antibiotic resistance is. Um, and it's contained within the, the, uh, uh, um, the book, um, the report that is on the right-hand side. Uh, and as you can see, it has the logos of both the Department of Health and Department for Environment, Food and Environmental, uh, uh, Food and, and Rural Affairs, DEFRA. Um, th this is seen very much as a cross-government issue um, and to stress the One Health approach that, uh, that, that has been mentioned already. But if, if we take... Uh, prevention is taken for granted because if you don't have an infection, you don't need antibiotics. Really, there are two main strands to the, the antibiotic, strat antibiotic resistance strategy, which is firstly to preserve what we've got and then to re-stimulate the, the production, uh, the market, uh, to produce new antibiotics. And so what I'll be, be doing is just going through that uh, in some more detail and updating you on what is happening in human medicine. Um, a very timely report was published about three weeks ago from the House of Commons Health and Social Care Committee, chaired by Sarah Williston. Um, and uh, this on antibiotic resistance um, made recommendations in five key areas. And I've um, greyed out the ones that don't relate specifically to humans. Um, and I'm just going to, for the rest of this talk, concentrate on the top three areas, um, that government should make antimicrobial resistance a top five policy priority. Uh, there's been a, a market failure in the production of new antibiotics, and that we need to review uh, and withdraw clinically unnecessary secondary care prescribing. Now, just remember that secondary care means in hospitals. Uh, primary care is in the community uh, prescription, particularly by, by GPs. Um, so, so I'll be making that, that distinction throughout this talk, primary and secondary care, but the, the House of Commons Select Committee report focuses particularly on secondary care. 
So um, let's think about the, the first one, priority. Again, as I've mentioned, antibiotic resistance is not a new, uh, new topic, and it has been recognized uh, as an important area for many, many years. Um, this um, was a report from the House of Lords Select Committee on Science and Technology from 1998, so uh, 20 years ago. Um, Lord Salisbury, who was a, uh, a veterinary um, surgeon, um, was a great advocate of, of, of this topic. And uh, as you can see from the quote, um, uh, really tried to emphasize the seriousness in, in, in his reports. Um, and perhaps many people have, have been critical since then, of, of saying these initial um, sort of alarms that were being rung perhaps weren't taken seriously enough. Um, that, that what, what, I mean, there was a strategy that was, was developed soon after this, because whenever the House of Lords uh, produces a report, government has to respond. Um, uh, perhaps, you know, that response wasn't as robust as it should have been. Uh, what did it actually achieve at that time? Well, it actually achieved quite a lot. Um, this is uh, data looking at the number of um, MRSA, or methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, bloodstream infections uh, in, in, in England. Um, so bloodstream infections, you know, sepsis, these are the most serious infections you can get. Uh, and uh, the, the number plummeted uh, throughout the early 2000s because of very aggressive performance management of uh, hospitals mainly um, to, to prevent these infections. So that was a great achievement. But perhaps in retrospect, we were too focused on this area and on Clostridium difficile diarrhea, which was the other um, uh, it, it, uh, infection that was targeted. And we sort of took our eyes off the ball, if you like. Um, but since then, um, a, a lot has happened. Uh, antimicrobial resistance and, and what is happening throughout the world is full of abbreviations and acronyms, and there are all sorts of different bodies and, uh, um, and projects and things that have been um, produced. Um, but uh, perhaps um, I, I just emphasize at the bottom there, uh, largely through the efforts of the chief medical officer, Dame Sally Davis in England, um, antimicrobial resistance was discussed at the UN General Assembly in New York in uh, uh, September 2016. And a resolution was passed that all the member states uh, would formulate an antimicrobial resistance plan. This was a massive achievement because, I, as far as I'm aware, it's only the second time that a health topic had been discussed by all the member states of the, uh, of the UN General Assembly. So there's no doubt that antibiotic resistance is being taken seriously. Um, and I, I don't know how many of you are aware that it's on the UK's National Risk Register. Uh, it's up there with climate change and terrorism as a major threat to the UK. Uh, however, uh, that was, um, it was put on the risk register um, at the time of the Cameron government, and which was very supportive of this issue. I think perhaps um, there are other priorities for government at the moment, as people will be aware. And um, hence, the House of <coughs> Commons Select Committee emphasizing that it really needs to uh, push this harder and make it a, a higher priority again. So um, to go back to why uh, AMR, or antimicrobial resistance, is, is a big issue now. Um, well, in the past, um, back to 1959, as we've seen, antibiotic resistance was developing. But um, the response in human medicine, certainly, was um, to simply change to another agent um, when resistance developed. And there was a constant pipeline of new agents that you could change to, uh, so that when um, uh, 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 one agent became superfluous or, or didn't, did not work, you simply went through your sort of armory uh, of antibiotics and changed to another one. And there are numerous examples of how treatment policies have evolved over the decades to, to reflect that. You know, treatment of gonorrhea, treatment of typhoid fever, treatment of tuberculosis, um, uh, treatment of simple cystitis or urinary tract infections. Uh, even in my practicing life, we've changed from one antibiotic to another as resistance has developed. But um, there aren't any more antibiotics um, to replace the ones that we've got at the moment. Um, in the United States, there's an organization called the Pew Charitable Trust, and they produced this very nice report, which is freely available on the internet, uh, a scientific roadmap for antibiotic discovery, which looks at the number of new antibiotic classes discovered uh, in each decade uh, going back to um, 
uh, um, beyond Fleming. Uh, and as you can see, there, there are no new, totally new classes of antibiotic uh, since the 1980s, um, which is absolutely remarkable. And they call this the, the um, discovery void, that we've had three decades now uh, where there have been no totally new antibiotics. There have been new compounds marketed, but they've all been tweaks, pharmace pharmaceutical tweaks of agents that we've got already. So that, that is a, a, a very long time and is distinctly worrying. Things have changed a little bit since then uh, because of efforts to re-stimulate uh, R&D in the antibiotic discovery area. Um, but in this report, which we produced in the New Statesman last year, we re reviewed what is currently in the antimicrobial pipeline. Um, and the bottom line is that very few agents are expected to come to market within the next five to 10 years. Um, and uh, at that time, we thought that maybe six. Um, uh, I think that's perhaps being over-optimistic. Uh, but just to compare that with some other areas, um, 170 diabetes drugs, 700 cancer drugs. It's really remarkable that the attention is not on antibiotic uh, um, drug discovery at the moment. And Big Pharma uh, reflects that because uh, most of the uh, the big companies are now withdrawing from the, the, the antibiotic development uh, field. And uh, it, at that point, it's just worth pausing and thinking, what is the point of having a new cancer drug uh, that potentially could cure you of cancer if you die of infection when you receive it? You know, it's, it's, without antibiotics, uh, all these new developments will comp be completely useless. So th th this is a simple model of a, a market, uh, um, uh, uh, so a reimbursement uh, for, for investment type um, model for, for an, an, a new antibiotic. Uh, and I, I just put this up, um, I mean, it's not, not rocket science, um, that at the beginning you have to invest uh, before you bring your new drug to market and then you'd hope you sell it and then you get profits and the profits reimburse you for the investment that you made to develop it. Um, but the, the, the investment is somewhere between, some estimate, it varies from where you look it up, but 500 million to a billion dollars. Um, and it's difficult, as many of you will know, involved in research projects, um, actually discovering a new antibiotic is scientifically challenging. Maybe we've, we've had most of the, the low-hanging fruit already. Um, then a lot of them, uh, the, the compounds that are produced, uh, do not actually get to market. There's a very high fallout. Um, it, that, that, the regulatory process that's required to take a drug to market is long and complex, and that eats into the patent period of the drug. So that, again, reduces the amount of profit um, through sales that a company can make. And then when we do get a new drug, because we're so concerned about the emergence of resistance, certainly in hospitals, we put it on the shelf and say you can't use it. So, so again, th this has been described um, uh, as a broken economy, and that's probably why a lot of the big companies feel that they don't want to invest in it anymore. Uh, and, and this is exemplified by, by this slide, really. So, so what the companies want um, is, if, if they're going to get a lot of sales, uh, a, a, an agent that is very broad spectrum that you can use for almost anything, um, that uh, is going to be used in huge quantities, as sales get, means money, uh, and is going to be used in the community. Whereas, as a profession, what we want in human medicine is something that's very targeted to a niche organism where resistance is a problem, uh, is only going to be used every now and again, the on-the-shelf antibiotic, uh, and is going to be used in secondary care, that is, the hospitals. So you can see why there is a conflict here. Uh, earlier this year, um, I was involved with a project uh, called Drive AB, uh, which was funded by the European Union. It's part of something called the Innovative Medicines Initiative. Um, and it was uh, set up as a partnership between uh, academia and the pharmaceutical industry to look at different ways in which you could incentivize drug companies to get back into this market. And I'm not going to go through this in, in detail, but one of the main principles was to um, uh, do something called de-linkage, which can be defined in several ways. And interestingly, um, 
that caused endless debates about how you define it, uh, but essentially was separating revenue from sales so that we, companies don't have to rely on huge sales of antibiotics to get um, the, the profits that they need, or rather they don't make the losses that are occurring at the moment. And that is, is going to be discussed further, uh, the whole concept around this area in one of the workshops. So I'm not going to go into any more detail now, other than to note the second paragraph here, which is the concept of a pipeline coordinator. And um, the, these are just two examples um, that um, are relevant for academia because they may be sources of funding. Um, uh, the first one, the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Par Partnership, or GARD-P, is, was set up uh, as a partnership between the WHO and the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative in Geneva. Um, and uh, as a pipeline coordinator, has a role, if, if you like, almost nannying uh, a, a new pr a potential antibiotic through to market. And the second one, CARBEX, the Combating uh, Antibiotic-Resistant Bacteria bi Biopharmaceutical Accelerator. That's a very um, snappy title. Uh, CARBEX is better. Um, is a public-private um, partnership um, that uh, Welcome uh, are, are involved, and they've recently been awarded um, perhaps uh, as much as 40 million euros from the German government to do the same, to, to take potential products and nanny them through uh, the regulatory process to market. Um, and uh, this is the sort of thing that they're hoping to do. I'm, I'm not intending you to, to read the small print on here, but it's just to show that each of these is a new compound for malaria treatment. And this slide is uh, on the website of an organization called the Medicines for Malaria Venture, which has been going, uh, based in Geneva again, has been going since the late 1990s, and now has um, uh, different parts of the, um, uh, the um, research and, and um, uh, uh, regulatory approval process, um, about 40 compounds that they've been able to take through development and uh, about 10 that have come through to market. So, so that is, if you like, a sort of example of um, what people are hoping will happen uh, with the, the uh, other uh, um, uh, uh, organizations as well for antibiotics. Okay, so let's turn now to the, the third section of, of the House of Commons report, antibiotic prescribing and secondary care. Um, I put this slide up really, again, just to introduce one of the, the workshops for this afternoon. I'm not going to go through in huge detail, but I think it's important that we, we recognize that in uh, human medicine, um, and I'm sure in veterinary medicine as well, most of the time when you prescribe an antibiotic, uh, at the time you're actually writing it out, you don't know what the cause of the infection is. That we don't know which bacterium it is, or indeed if it's a bacterial infection at all, uh, for certain. It's based on uh, uh, assessment of clinical signs and symptoms and whatever diagnostic test results that we can, we can get to help us. Um, but usually at the time of the prescription, we don't know for certain what the organism is. And that uh, has uh, big issues, big consequences. Uh, and clearly is a, an issue in terms of appropriateness of, of um, treatment of, uh, uh, of suspected bacterial infection. Um, this, again, is, is a topic of one of the workshops, which is looking at um, the use of diagnostic tests uh, um, and the concept of diagnostic stewardship, um, the most appropriate use of diagnostic tests to, to improve patient outcomes. So I'm not going to go through that in more detail. But I will touch on antibiotic prescribing, uh, and particularly antibiotic prescribing in secondary care. So um, these data are from SPOW, which is uh, the European surveillance, sorry, the English surveillance program for antibiotic utilization uh, and resistance, which is uh, run by Public Health England. Um, it's an old slide, deliberately chosen, because I think it shows very nicely trends over time. Uh, but there, um, this is from the SPOW annual report of 2015, um, sorry, 16. Um, there is, uh, in a couple of weeks ago, the SPOW report for 2018 was produced. Again, that's freely available on the internet and is a good resource to look at. Um, but, but I show this to firstly demonstrate in blue how much prescribing is done in general practice. That is primary care. Um, look at the, the yellow bar, the 
Good, yes, in some projections, the orange and the yellow blur together a little bit, but in yellow, hospital inpatients, secondary care, is actually quite a small proportion of the total antibiotic use in humans. So um, you can see that there was a peak in 2012, and since then, total antibiotic use, as measured by daily defined doses per 1,000 inhabitants per day, has declined by some 6% or so. Up until that point, and certainly in the 10 years up to 2012, it had increased by about 17%, with a, it seemed to be the, the rate of increase appeared to be accelerating. So when back down now to where we were in 2010, which is a good thing, um, but most of that has been driven by reduced prescribing in primary care by GPs. Uh, and that's why uh, uh, the House of Commons Select Committee is focusing particularly now on secondary care. But actually, um, even reducing secondary care prescribing by quite a lot is not going to make a big difference to the overall uh, um, uh, exposure of the population to antibiotics. There have been big uh, advances in the way, though, that we get the data. Um, I'm just going to quickly flip through some screenshots from something called fingertips. Uh, again, freely available on the internet, uh, so people can look at their own uh, community area, their own hospitals, and compare them um, for a, a variety of different indices of measurement of antibiotic utilization, and you can produce graphs like this which show you geographical variation. And that, of course, is very helpful uh, looking at variation to try and understand why that is and, uh, and focus particularly on the areas that are extremes, both the low and the high, uh, to see whether that is appropriate. Now, in secondary care, we have a conflict because um, we've been talking about reducing antibiotic uh, usage, uh, but actually starting, antibiotic prom starting antibiotics promptly is very important. Um, this is quite an old study from 2006, but it just demonstrates in the black bars, if I'm just going to focus on that, that uh, the longer you wait after a patient has developed signs of sepsis, the worse the outcome is. And it's a really very significant decline uh, every hour after the antibiotics start. So um, giving antibiotics promptly is, uh, is very important. So simply saying you need to wait in hospital is not going to work because people are going to die. And that is the focus of the national um, Start Smart Then Focus antibiotic stewardship uh, guideline for, for, for England. Um, that you, It recognizes that you do need to start antibiotics in many patients. But then what we aim to do is to review that at 48 to 72 hours. And increasingly, and there are a number of things you can do at that review, obviously uh, continuing as you are, uh, or what we're trying to encourage is that in patients who subsequently are found not to have an infection, that you stop. And at the moment, again, this is data from fingertips, so it's freely available. These are all acute hospitals in England. Uh, each of them is a blue dot. Um, on the, the uh, vertical axis, the, the proportion of antibiotic prescriptions that are reviewed at 48 to 72 hours. So we're generally quite good, so most of the dots are towards the top. Um, and then the proportion that are uh, then followed by a stop decision. Uh, and at median is about 16%. Um, and you can see there's huge variation, though. Uh, we don't know what is ideal, but there, are, there is a suggestion that perhaps it might be 30 to 35% that could be done safely. Um, but uh, that, that's interesting. That's work in progress. Currently, the focus is of a large multi-center study. So, so as I come to an end, I'm just going to highlight some resources to you, other things that are going on. Um, this is a free antibiotic stewardship book, an e-book, um, which was produced by BSAC, uh, and um, it has had about now 2,500 downloads, uh, a variety of different countries. Uh, many people in this room have, have authored chapters in it, and it is free. So uh, by all means, go and look at that if you want to. Uh, watch a very good film. It's only 15 minutes long. Catch. Um, the little girl on the left uh, has an infection that can't be treated with antibiotics. She's actually one of the actresses from the stage show Matilda. Um, and it, as you can see, it's got lots of awards already and is, it's quite sad. Um, but that, that's, again, free to watch from the link that I put on there. Uh, and go and see the musical, The Mold, um, all about penicillin. Um, this is its premiere in the Science Museum. Um, it's aimed at year six children, 
Um, the Scottish Health Minister has signed all primary schools in Scotland up to producing it in, as their stage show in their, their year, and uh, Sally Davis is keen to do the same in England, although logistically it's more difficult. Um, so that, that's good fun as well. And then finally, just to summarise, um, David Cameron asked Jim O'Neill, uh, a renowned economist, to do a re review of antimicrobial resistance, um, almost as a, as a sort of an outside view. Um, his report was published a couple of years ago, had uh, 29 specific recommendations within it. And at a um, conference in the summer, he was asked what the status of progress with those recommendations was. And um, this was his response. He thought there'd been progress in R&D and investment um, and in early development of new compounds, lots of small, medium enterprise companies uh, developing new compounds. But the area still that where we needed to make significant progress was engagement of the big pharmaceutical companies uh, and also in the use of diagnostic tests, which, as I, I've mentioned, was one of the areas of the workshops for this afternoon. And I finish with just um, the, the two conundrums in the use of antibiotics in humans. First, most use of antibiotics in humans is to treat an infection that they haven't got. And then secondly, worldwide, more people die because they cannot get an antibiotic than as a result of antibiotic resistance. So this is the classic uh, excess versus access conundrum um, that uh, battles everyone, I think, in, in terms of dealing with this, uh, this issue. And I, I finished there. Thank you.